Welcome back to Milan Recording Studios. My name is James Pavel Chakras, and in today's video, I have a super exciting announcement for you, and that is that I have finally created and posted online a score for the treble test piece. I think I first came out with this piece in like 2017, and ever since I first debuted it on the channel, just casually in one of my piano reviews, it's there's been a growing number of people who have wanted the score for it so that they could play it themselves. And the reason I've never made one until now is because I've never really considered this piece to be complete. There's still so much more I'd want to try doing with this piece that I haven't had the chance to try to do with it yet. There's just been so many other things that have been on the front burner that this continually gets pushed to the back. However, for now, this is version one. This is iteration one of the treble test piece. And for now, it is temporarily complete. So the score is available for free online for you to download and learn at your own leisure. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the history of this piece and why I've decided now to release the score. Why not two years from now when I expand more on it? Well, I thought I'd release it now because of some things that have happened in the past with this piece. As I've mentioned, there's a large number of you who enjoy this piece. And there's actually been a few people who have taken the trouble to learn it by ear and play their own version of it in videos of their own, which on the surface, I don't have a huge issue with, and it's actually really flattering that people enjoy this piece enough to learn it by ear and then play it in their own videos, but, and it kind of makes me feel bad to say this, but I thought that those versions weren't quite satisfactory. I didn't think that they represented this piece in its best light. So I thought it would be best if I finally did release the score for it, but not only just release the score, what I've decided to do, as you can see, this video is quite long, I'm going to make a detailed tutorial. We're going to go line by line and show you how to play this piece. We're going to give you practice tips, all that stuff for the treble test piece so that you all can go home and learn it and follow the guidelines of the way I play it, imitate my performance, and of course, put your own small little twists on it here and there. So that's why I'm releasing the score now because I think it's really cool that people want to play my piece. But if you want to play my piece, I'd like you all to be doing it well. So that's what this tutorial part's going to be. If there's enough interest in this tutorial, leave a comment down below if you've enjoyed it and if you liked the style, because I'm interested in doing more tutorial and teaching videos. I've made a little community post about it recently, got more feedback than I'd expected and very positive feedback too. So let me know if you'd be interested in seeing more tutorial videos about playing the piano from basic level things all the way up to more advanced techniques. Pretty much anything under the sun involving how to play the piano, I would be willing to make a video on. So if you're interested in tutorial videos, please let me know down in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know down in the comment section. And there's one more thing I wanted to talk about before we dive into the tutorial section of today's video. And that is, if you decide to learn this piece for yourself and you want to upload a video of you playing it, that would be really cool. And I would love for you to send me a video of you playing the treble test piece to the best of your abilities. Whether you're an eight-year-old child playing it as best as you can that's above the average eight-year-old skill level, or if you're someone who's 80 and you've been learning the piano for four years and you're doing the best you can and you're proud of this performance, I would love to see those videos. The only caveat is that you can't really post them to the YouTube comments on this video or any other because they'll end up get put, getting put in the spam file. So in the comment section and the description of this video, I will not only have a link to the score itself, which is viewable for free on my Patreon, but you'll also see a link to my website where you can go and submit a, um, a link on my contact page. There'll be a contact page, kind of like an email thing, right? So you can just put in your email and put a link to your video. And that will get sent to me and I'll be able to see and read all of those. So if you're interested in sending me a video, feel free to do it that way. The link is in the description and a pinned comment. In addition to that, like I said, the score is available for free on my Patreon. If you wanted to, to join the Patreon, you could, but you don't have to, to get the score for this video. I did this for convenience. I couldn't think of a better place to post this and it's pretty easy to get to Patreon and view this post. If there's any problems viewing it or downloading the score, let me know. I'm not anticipating any problems, but now let's dive into the treble test piece played on the Viscount Legend 70s because it has a nice piano sound. 
So here we have the very first line of the treble test piece up on screen right now, and in front of me here is the Viscount Legend 70s. So we are going to take a look and a walk through each and every line of the treble test piece, and I'll give you some practice tips and performance pointers for this piece that I think might be helpful. A couple of things I wanted to mention beforehand is that I am playing this on a 73 key instrument, so there will be a couple of notes at the end that I don't actually have access to on this instrument. Part of the reason I wanted to do this video on the Viscount Legend 70s is, is for this exact reason. Not all of you may have an 88 key keyboard, so I wanted to show you some ways in which you can compromise, I suppose you could say, for the lack of keys. Just because I'm using a really low note on the piano or a very high note like at the end doesn't necessarily mean that you can't play this piece if you don't have those notes on your instrument at home. The other thing I wanted to talk about is that I'm taking the approach in this tutorial of understanding that some of you, actually many of you, are likely coming from different backgrounds and are at different skill levels of the piano. So some of the things I talk about in this video may be things that you already know, but hopefully some of the things I talk about in this tutorial are things that you don't know, and hopefully this tutorial will be helpful. So let's dive in and start analyzing and discussing the first line of the treble test piece. For starters, let's look at some of the things that everyone would look at when given a new piece of music, like the key signature, the time signature, the tempo, and also, especially with this one, the clefs. So for starters, let's start off with the time signature, which is the standard 4-4 timing that we all know and love. That means that there are four beats per measure and that the quarter note gets the beat, so that in basically you'd have four quarter notes per measure. Quarter notes can be split up into eighth notes, with two eighth notes having the same value as one quarter note, and we'll see a lot of eighth notes in this piece. And it actually doesn't deviate a lot from eighth notes. We do get a few dotted quarter notes, which we'll talk about later, and you can actually see some of them in the first lines. We'll be talking about them pretty soon. That's basically the time signature. For this key signature, it's also pretty simple. We have one flat in the key signature, and that means that we are in the key of F major. So anytime you see a B, you're going to want to make it be a B flat instead. The tempo is pretty slow. Over the years, I've played it differently. Some years I've played it kind of fast, and some years, like now, I tend to play it pretty slow and be very resonant if for the opening line. Um, so the tempo can kind of vary. I wouldn't play it really, really fast. My tempo is slowly. I at first had a strict metronome timing, but I was like, you know, I don't really obey a strict metronome time when I perform this piece, so I won't put that in the sheet music either. The timing, not the timing, but the tempo can be pretty free-flowing. And the timing can be as well. We'll talk about that in a bit too. The clefs is probably the only real anomaly in this first line. Not all of you may recognize what that top clef is. It looks like a treble clef, but with a weird deformity on top. And that basically means to play the top line of the grand staff like you would the treble clef, but an octave higher. So if our first note is A, and normally that would be this A, which is the A right above middle C, instead of playing it here, you just move it up an octave. If you wanted to, you could learn the first two lines of this piece an octave lower if playing an octave higher than what's written kind of weirds you out, and then just move it up higher once you know that part better. Now, I could have written the entire first two lines with a whole bunch of ledger lines and had a normal treble clef there, but I thought that would be kind of difficult to read. I wouldn't want to read that, and I didn't think most of you would either, so that's why I used the uh, octaved up treble clef. Where the bass clef normally would be, we also have a treble clef, and that means that our first note in the left hand is going to be this F, the one right above middle C. So you're going to play this with your left hand, but read it as if it's treble clef, which you would normally play with your right hand. So that's basically a general outline of the um, first page of the treble test piece. You can see that our dynamic marking here is piano, so play it quietly. I was pretty vague with dynamic markings. I do have some general markings throughout the whole piece that we'll look at later, and some general tempo markings. Some of them I kind of omitted because every time I play this piece, I play it a little differently. It's like this living, evolving, breathing song. So this isn't a strict thing to follow, but it is a general good guideline to follow when playing the treble test speech. So let's play through the first line and I'll show you some of the interpretive things that I'm doing here. Sounds beautiful. So that's basically the first line and that's how to play it. Now an interesting thing 
is that those left hand notes, although they are eighth notes, and normally that means you wouldn't want to hold them, you just do them like this. With this piece, you actually want to hold those down. So you'd want to do them kind of like that and actually play them when they're held down. And that pretty much applies to the left hand throughout most of this piece. So don't play it like this. And in fact, I think a good practice tip would be to practice it without the pedal. This is a treble test piece and it's meant to kind of show off the beautiful resonance that you have in a piano when the pedal is held down and all the strings are free to vibrate. But I think when you're practicing and first learning this piece, it might be good to not play with the pedal down because as you can see in the score, everything here is legato. That's what those little lines above the notes mean. It means to play them connectedly. So you wouldn't want to be playing the piece without pedal like this. Without the pedal, you'd want it to be very connected as much as possible. And also, I feel like a lot of the times that extra F at the end of that first measure, a lot of the times I feel like I don't play that. But hopefully you can hear the difference there between playing it legato, like the second time, and playing it not legato, like the first time. So legato means to connect the notes as much as possible and to hold down those left hand notes. And pretty much the same thing goes for the right hand as well. Just play it connected, play it smooth, and play it nicely. Also play it quietly, as I've been doing here, you wouldn't want to play it like this. We definitely want to play it quietly and nice to give us a place to go and kind of accelerate to, not accelerate, but a kind of a place to expand later on in the piece. The final thing, there's two more things I wanted to talk about here in the first line, which is the rubato and also the triplet. You can kind of hear me play that triplet in the third measure. Uh, it's pretty simple to do. Um, but a nice tip here is the way that triplet's working is that it's pretty much three notes in the place of one. Um, but you don't necessarily have to think about it like that. If playing those in the exact rhythm is a little bit too tough, you can feel free to slow down that little triplet a little bit, which is actually a tip that I get a lot when I get, um, when I'm working with like my piano teachers and I'm playing like a Baroque piece or even classical that has some ornamentation like a trill or a turn. A lot of the times I tend to play those turns a little bit too fast and it's better, it actually sounds better if you slow down those ornaments just a little bit to make them very crisp and precise. So you can do that here as well. So instead of doing, if metronomically you'd want to do it like this. But if that's too fast or if you don't like the way that sounds, you can always slow down that 16th note triplet a little bit kind of like that. And that kind of brings us into the tempo and timing freedom that we have in this piece. I've been playing it pretty metronomically here in the tutorial so far, but when you actually perform it, you wouldn't want to play it robotically at an exact, crisp, precise timing. You'd want to kind of let the timing flow a little bit, which is why I say with rubato at the beginning. Rubato kind of basically means that there's a kind of a push and a pull to the timing. You can give one note a little bit more value and then play the next few notes a little bit shorter than they normally would be, things like that can make this piece sound a little bit better. So here it is with the pedal and with the right expression, but without rubato. And here it is with a little bit more flow to the timing. So that's kind of how that works. You can have a little bit of flexibility there with the timing. It doesn't have to be purely metronomic. The last thing, the truly the last thing that's pretty true for the rest of this piece is the pedaling. How does that work? I didn't notate it in the typical, typical classical style. Well, basically, pedal the entire measure. So for the first measure, you'd want to hold the pedal down from the very beginning.
And then when you play the first note of the next measure, lift up the pedal and put it back down, like so. So that's the way the pedaling works in this piece. Hold it down for the full measure until you play the next note of the next measure. On that note, you lift the pedal up and push it back down again. Pretty simple. That's everything there is to talk about for the first line. Let's move on to the next line, the second line, which this is what we're seeing here up on screen now, the second line of the piece, which picks up, of course, right from where the first one left off. So we're going to want to play this. The first A is a tie from the previous measure. So you're going, want, you're, you're going to want to hold the A from the fourth measure of line two over into the first measure of line two. So this is how that works. We have all the same concepts from line one introduced in line two. Everything's legato. We're still able to be a little bit free with the uh, the timing, just a little bit, not too much. Um, and pretty much everything here, all the concepts remain the same. We have another triplet at the end of the line. Again, same rules apply. You can slow that down a little bit if you don't like playing it uh, precisely in the timing. And really the only thing new in our second line is that strange symbol above the last note. And something I should have added in here in the last measure is a retardando, which means to slow down. I don't have that in the sheet music. You can totally have one there though if you want. It's kind of a small one, but what retardando means, like I said, is to slow down. Just kind of gradually decrease your tempo. So and if you don't want to do a retardando, at the very least, definitely hold on to that last note a little bit, that very last C. Before moving on to the last line. I exaggerate it there a bit, but that's basically the general concept. So you don't have to do a return under at the end, that would have sounded like this. Just a very gentle slow down of the tempo, and then you'd resume your normal tempo in the next line. You don't have to do that, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but definitely do that fermata, which means to hold the note's value for longer than it's written for. So that would be like this. And from here we'll move on to the third line. So that is the sound of the third line. You can see why I want that fermata in the previous line, because we have a sudden dramatic shift in sound and quality. Now, my little notation of with warmth is difficult, if not impossible, to do on a digital piano. However, just by playing in a lower register it does kind of give a bit of a more warmer tone. The treble is cold, and the lower end of the piano is more warm. But if you're playing this on a real acoustic piano, give a little bit more arm weight, play it relaxed, and just kind of dig in just a little bit to give it a little bit more of a deeper, warmer tone. The piano will help you out with that, but if you can help the piano do that as well, you'll get a very nice sound. As I said, this piece has kind of evolved from being a strictly treble test piece over the years, and it actually ends up playing some low bass notes later on in the piece, which is kind of fun. So we kind of actually get a pretty wide range of uh, the test piece here, but it, it's all gradual. You're not actually playing a crazy range at once, so it's never actually that difficult. So in the third line here, we've got a few new techniques. We have a slightly louder dynamic. We have mezzo piano, which means kind of medium quiet, so a little bit louder than you played before. Um, you don't want to play it super loud because we're still building in the piece. We still need a place to go from here. We still need to get a little louder as the piece goes on. So play it a little bit louder than you did in the previous section. And again, play everything nice and legato and connected. I'll play that line again for you so you can follow along. Now you could also put a little trill or a, a little 16th note triplet right there. I tend to do that. I didn't write it in the sheet music because I wanted to have that come later in the piece, but I often just instinctively put it there. So if you want to put one there, you totally can.
Something else to note is that the rule of pedaling, where we release the, f the pedal on the first note, is broken with the first line of this measure. Hold the pedal over from the previous measure. But for all everything else in this third line, follow that little pedaling rule. I was playing a little slower there and obvious to hopefully you could tell when I was lifting up the pedal. The focus of this line, the melody is in the right hand. The melody is this. So that's where you're going to want to accentuate the bass as kind of an accompaniment, and then the melody is the... So that's what that is. Um, and the only other new concept that's introduced in this third line is in the fourth measure of it, you'll see that the F and the D are connected with a slur. And there's a slur, that little line, over only two notes. And that may look the same as every other slur we've already seen, but it's actually different. It's called a two-note slur, for obvious reasons. And what that means is it actually has more meaning than just playing the notes connectedly. The second note should be a little bit quieter than the first note. Very subtly, but it should be just a little bit quieter than the first. So that's what a two-note slur means. Whenever you see that in music, classical music especially, it means that the second second note should be kind of like a gentle echo of the first. A little bit subtle in this instance, but it should be, it, you should have that idea. It shouldn't be, that would not be a proper two note slur. The fourth line of the piece here pretty much picks up a lot of what the, first, what the third line laid down. We have pretty much the same idea with the 16th note triplet at the end and a little different melody at the end, but everything else is pretty much the same. You can also see at that fourth measure it says poco rit. That is an abbreviation for retardando, which we've already talked about, and poco means a little. So you're going to want to slow down a little at the end of that measure, kind of like I mentioned at the end of line two. Do that same kind of thing here at the end of line four. And I'll play this for you again, but like I said, it's basically the same as line three. So that's basically the way that line works. You got the little uh, triplet there. And from here, we go on to the next line. That triplet is a little bit tricky to do with four and five. I'm trying to play it as quietly as, I, as possible. And I'm kind of having a little bit of trouble getting every single note to sound. So if you want to change the fingering there, I do four and five most of the time. But if you want to do three and four, that might make life easier. The fifth line, the last line on page one, is completely different from everything else we've seen for a few different reasons. For starters, the little squiggly lines next to some of the chords means to roll them. So you wouldn't play that first chord like this. Instead, you'd play it like this. Every note is a little bit delayed, and that's called a rolled chord. You can also see my little notation of voice the top notes. I'll tell you what that means in a little bit here. You can also see we have mezzo forte, so our dynamic is going to get a little bit louder than it was before. Part of this is natural. The piano will do this for you because you're playing more notes at one time, so it's going to be louder. But by playing a little bit more forcefully, not loud and bright, but just a little bit more full, will give you a nice sound. Um, also, the bass line pattern changes here as well. Instead of just doing... Now we have more of an intricate thing. Still simple. So that's basically the bass line pattern. And now let me play this line for you. Hopefully you can tell what I meant there by voice the top notes. The melody for the section is the top note of the chord. So that means that when you're playing the chord, you aren't going to want to play it like this. You want that melody to be a little bit louder and more prominent than the rest of the chord.
This might take a little bit of practice, but it is definitely doable, and if you can do it, it'll make this section sound a lot better. The other tricky thing is which notes are being held and which notes aren't. Again, you can see there's a lot of legato. The left hand is going to be very legato and connected. The right hand will as well, and this is probably the only real challenge in this piece is to hold down some notes while other fingers are doing other things. So if you look here at the first chord, which is that F major, you can see that the uh, A, the C, and the F are all dotted um, quarter notes. And you're actually going to want to hold them down while you're playing that G. So you can see that they're still ringing there. Um, that's pretty important, and you can also see that the next chord, I'll play it for you. The F, the A, and the C are all tied as well over, and the only note that you play on beat three is going to be your G. I meant to say the upbeat of beat three, but that's the general idea. You're going you're gonna to want to hold that chord and play it like that. So that's the way that works. You can see this kind of coming up um, throughout the next three lines, so it's a pretty common theme. I kind of wrote it in two different ways. If you look at measure two of this line, you'll see that I have a tie that's connecting the F major chord to the next note. But then the note after that, I have a pair of half notes at the bottom. Because if I had ties there, it would just look really ugly. So for some of the notes, I used ties. And for other notes, I used longer duration notes. But the concept is the same. So the second measure of uh, the fifth line here would sound like this. And if I let go of the pedal, you can hear that these notes, and you can see that those notes are being held as long as possible. Just like that. So it might be wise to practice that exact thing, if that kind of thing is giving you trouble, but if you're able to do that, it'll make this piece sound very nice. The third measure, same idea, you've got those half notes there, so you've, it, the right hand will go like this. And that's with no pedal. So you're going to want to hold these two for as long as possible. Just like that. Let's move on to the first line of the second page. You can see that two there at the top. That means we're at the top of the second page. So we've actually moved along pretty far here, and we've gotten pretty far. Hopefully this tutorial has been very helpful for you all, and I hope that you all are enjoying it so far. If you are, leave, give, give this video a like. Thank you very much. All right. This line is very similar to the line that we've just seen. The melody changes up a little bit, but other than that, it's pretty much the same idea. Hold the notes for as long as you possibly can, and at the end of this line, you can see the strange line that kind of grows apart there. That's called a crescendo, and what that means is your dynamics, your volume, is going to slowly grow and get louder as that line progresses, beginning in that third measure. So let's try this out, starting from the first measure of this line. Perfect. So that's how that goes, the same concepts as before. Pretty nice. Pretty simple. I'm not going to explain too much here because I've already talked about all the same concepts of holding the notes down and voicing the top notes. All of that remains true in this line. So let's move on to the next line on page two, which we're seeing now on the screen. And this line features a lot of the same techniques of holding the notes down, but our chords change. So you can see here, instead of starting like this, we're now starting like this. So our melody is going to jump up to that C.
That's what our melody is for that line. I'll play it once more, a little bit slower. That G should not be uh, crisp like that, by the way. That's my bad. So that is how that line sounds. Um, it's going to be a bit more intense than the previous line as marked by that F at the beginning, which means forte. So if mezzo forte or the MF means medium loud, forte means loud. So this is going to be the loudest, most climactic section of the piece of music. And kind of like the crescendo, that strange line at the end of the measure or at the end of the line that goes like this. That means diminuendo. It can also be called a decrescendo. And basically that means get softer. So we're going to be begin this measure loud, not brassy and bright, but just solid and kind of loud. And then at the end of that third measure, we're going to want to start kind of bringing that volume down. And that last measure should be a little bit quieter. You can also slow down for it as well if you wanted to. One more time. So that's how that works. That's that line. And let's move on. Because as you can see, that A, that doesn't quite belong there, right? That's leading us on to the next measure. So let's go check out the next line. Boom, there it is. So that A is going to lead us into a theme that might sound familiar. So that theme is kind of like we had at the beginning of the piece where it went like this. This is the same kind of theme except the it's kind of shifted a little bit into the measure it begins on the first beat instead of not on the first beat like earlier, but it's kind of the same idea. However, this section should be very slow, very free-flowing tempo, even more rubato than we had at the beginning of the piece, but it should kind of have that same sort of feel. And you'll see that that first line there says ritardando, so we're going to want to kind of slow down very gradually, but slow down throughout this entire section and just really kind of bring everything to a halt. The previous line, we'll pop that back up on screen, the previous line was intense, right? You had the big chords, the loud dynamic, everything was happening at once. And then in this line, which we'll put back up on screen, everything drops out. We get these low bass notes, which we'll talk about in a second. You have the some of the simplest harmony so far, just one note at a time, and just everything's just going to slow down here. Uh, and that's kind of what's happening here. So let's play it again one more time. And that those last few notes were a little teaser of what's to come, which should sound familiar. Um, but that's basically everything here in this line. Now, the final thing I wanted to talk about is those low bass notes. You can see that on my 73 key instrument, it only goes down to a low E. However, in the first measure, we have a low F. The second measure, we have a very low D. The third measure, we have a very, very low C. That's going to be the lowest C on your piano if you have an 88 key instrument. Uh, I could have written them with an 8 VB, like an octave below. Um, if you guys want me to, I could reprint it and put that there, but I didn't really know that I should put an octave below icon for just one note. So I just wrote it manually with all the ledger lines. If you forget what note it is, it's just an octave below what you're already playing. So in that measure of C, you're going to jump an octave below that low C, which my instrument doesn't have. So what should I do instead? Well, if you have an instrument that doesn't have 88 keys and you can't get to those low notes, just play the last note again, but quieter. Think of it as kind of like a two-note slur. Remember the two-note slur? Kind of create one there. So do this kind of thing.
If you do that, it'll have the same kind of effect without the extra bassiness, right? But it's the same idea. That low note is an echo of the last note that we just played. So whether it's an octave lower or the same note, it doesn't really matter. It'll have the same basic effect. At the end of this line, you can see we have a fermata. So that means that high F, we're going to want to hold on to that and just kind of savor that moment a bit. Before reducing our volume back to piano and playing the the main theme, I guess uh, again. So that line should be very familiar. The a tempo means to resume your original tempo. So if you remember the previous line that we just looked at, the third line of the second page. We had the ritardando and the poco meno mosso at the end, which I think I forgot to mention, but that means slow down even more. It means a little more. Um, so you'd want to begin your ritardando, slow down, and then do even more slow at that very last measure. And then on the fourth line, it says a tempo, which means to kind of gently resume your original tempo once more. So you wouldn't continue playing in your new slow tempo. You'd gradually, gently go back to the previous tempo that we started off the piece with. The fourth line of the piece, um, actually, sorry, the fifth line on this page is pretty much a mirror of the previous line that we just saw. We'll take a look at it now. However, that last measure is now different. In very tiny text, I put over that last measure that there is an optional repeat. You could go back to, if we put it up on screen, the bottom line of the first page. There it is now. If you notice at the beginning of that line, there is a thick bar line with little dots next to it. That's kind of a backwards repeat sign. And if you look at the second to last line on the second page, the one we were just looking at, you can see that there's that same thing, but facing the other way. You've got the thick bar line and you've got the two dots on this, if the bar line's here, you've got your dots here. So that's called a repeat sign. So the repeat sign means that you repeat back. If there's no backwards facing repeat sign, you'd go back to the beginning. But because I put a backwards repeat sign at the bottom of page one, you'd repeat back to there, play it through all over again. And then when you come back to your main repeat sign at the bottom of page two, you just go right through and play the next line. So let's play through the section with all the big chords, um, we will start at the end of um, page two, and we'll go play through that whole section again. And that brings us to the final line, where we're going to want to blend it from the previous line. I just stopped so I could talk about it. And then we're going to do a diminuendo as well as a retardando. The poco meno mozo means a little even quieter, even slower. You just really just trail out and peter out at the end. I kind of added this in. I do play something similar at the end of my treble test piece, but I wrote it down on paper. And once again, we have a low octave F there, which I actually do have the keys for on my instrument. But if you don't have those keys, just play something something in the key of F, play an F triad, play F with fifths, so you play F, C, and F. That sounds almost as good as this, except it's a little less meaty, but it's still kind of complex, and it totally works fine. So if you don't have enough keys to play the low F, don't worry about it. Just play something like that, and you'll be good to go. So the final line blending from the previous measure would go like this.
And the final high F, I don't have access to, so I played the F that would be an octave lower than it. it. Sounds a little better if you're able to play that high F, but alas, I don't have it on my 73 key instrument. So let's go through again, play that last line one more time, give you guys an idea of how it's supposed to go. And this time I didn't even play the low octaved F. Low octaved F. I just held my hand in that position. So you could also do that too, and it would sound just as beautiful. I hope you have enjoyed the treble test piece tutorial. It was a lot of fun to make. It's been a long time since I've done a teaching style video, and if there's enough interest in doing teaching style videos, please let me know down in the comments section below. Lately, I've been very inspired to make videos about teaching the piano. I've been really fortunate to work with really, really renowned, actually world-class instructors for like 16 years of my life up to the present day, and I would love to be able to kind of put some of that education out towards you all as well and give you some tips and tricks, even if they're just basic level things about how to play a C major chord. Even something that simple would be fun to make a video about and really break down the basics of playing the piano. I've done stuff like this before, but my audience is bigger now, so if there's more interest, please let me know. I hope you enjoyed this treble test piece. Go download the video, make a video of your own playing this if you want to, and feel free to send those to my website. Thank you very much, and I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye.